Mi gente, I've got the perfect freebie for you. So I just dropped a 17-page workbook to help you get your mind right, especially in this climate of so much uncertainty. So if you are an aspiring or current entrepreneur and you're just feeling stuck, you're not feeling too good about what the future holds and all the turmoil, the politics, all of it is just throwing you off your game, this workbook is actually going to act as a journal for you. It covers goal setting, efficiency tips, how to manage your time, financial management tips, strategies on how to wrap your head around the next big thing that's coming down the pipeline to bring you consistent revenue in your business. It covers what you should be doubling down on in terms of your well-being. And it is just my favorite jam-packed journal full of marketing and sales strategy to help you get clarity, but most importantly, to help you secure the big bag. So make sure to tap on the link in the show notes. I've linked it there so that you guys can get really clear clear on the top hacks that you can put into play in 2024 to set yourself up for success. I hope you love it. Growing up Latina was just something that it, it was it was a project where if God forbid I'm no longer here, this will always remain. The biggest sacrifices I made was dipping into my 401k account and that, I mean, I cried for that. Let me take a step back to take two steps forward on this project. I have to keep going and everybody was like, Ali, chill out. Like, we see you, but like, you're gonna go broke. I really believe in myself. I think if you do anything that you really are passionate about, you have to have the belief that you can do it. No, I, I would never take it back. Really? I would never take it back. So no regrets? No. Why are we like keeping this a secret? I don't understand. And they're like, we don't want people to know. And I'm like, it's, but it's fine. There's so much that I wanna say. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Banking on Cultura. I am your host, Victoria Jen Rodriguez. And you know, here on Banking on Cultura, we like to talk about the vibrancy and complexity of Latino culture, entrepreneurship, y all the bonchinche in between. And with today's guest, we're going to hit on all three components. So let's get into it. Ali V is the founder and CEO of the Ali V Experience, a full-service creative agency with experimental marketing at its core. She has worked with notable clients in media and entertainment, including Little Kim, James Harden, Floyd Mayweather, RZA, Angie Martinez, Dream Doll, and the Notorious Big Estate, amongst many others. She started her career in broadcasting as an on-air personality at Sirius XM Shade 45's VIP Saturdays and Hip Hop Nation. She has contributed to the New York Post and TMZ Live, as well as she's been a red carpet on-air correspondent for MTV Music Awards, as well as the Tony Awards. But what I'm most excited about is her work with Growing Up Latina, which is her podcast where she essentially gives Latinas their flowers. And what I love about today's episode is it is our opportunity to give her her flowers today. So welcome, Ali V, oh to Banky Cultura. Thank you for having me. You welcome. That I am was, so excited whew, to have you. That here. intro was everything. Girl, we giving you, you your flowers today, okay? <laughs> Thank you. When we were prepping for today's conversation, mm-hmm. I told you, I was like reading your brario and I was like, yo. This chick is really badass, Thank like you. really doing amazing work in the community and also just in front of the camera and also behind the camera because there thank aren't you. many Latinas who are doing that type of work. So mm-hmm. thank you for doing no, that No, thank work. you for having me. Honestly. So we'd like to kick things off with what's the bochinche. So give, a, give us what's some tea, darling. Give us some tea. What's the bochinche? What's the latest and greatest? What's the latest and greatest? Tell us. Oh, like how much tea do I want to spill right now? You want to give us all the tea? (laughs) Like on a professional or personal level? Well, you know what I like to advise guests to give us? Like tell us something we can't Google about you. (laughs) We got to stop, y'all. There's so much that I want to say. Spit out the first thing that comes to mind. I'm dating. Okay. I'm dating. So that, that feels exciting. Okay. For me, and I like a boy. <laughs> <laughs> I like a boy, so I'm just trying to see where it goes. I never really speak on, like, relationships or anything like that. I always try to keep those things private. But I don't know. I'm, like, in this new era of, like, let me just explore, have fun. And it's it's going good. So is has your 
you know, kind of philosophy around keeping things private mm-hmm. is because you come from the entertainment business and you've seen all the things. Yeah, I, I mean, it's so funny. Like, I'm not the kind of post in public type of chick in terms of like any relationships that I am may have been a part of just because I feel like what's more important, the relationship or social media. So I rather like cultivate the relationship behind the scenes, see where it goes. I feel like if people see me with someone on the gram is because I'm engaged and I'm like, I said yes Mm -hmm. type of energy. But I don't know. I feel like I like to keep those two separate. So my Instagram is like really for business purposes only. Like I barely show my family. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's like it's like weird. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, Banging on Cultura exclusive. Ali is dating. She's interested in somebody. That's real tea right there. We might have her back so she could tell us the updates and all the things. <laughs> uh, so we could be all in your business. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Only you. Only you could be in my business. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So one of the main reasons why I wanted you on the podcast mm-hmm. was because of your podcast, Growing Up Latina. Mm-hmm. It, it was one of the inspirations behind Banking a Cultura. Mm-hmm. Like, I studied your work. Mm-hmm. I admire your interview style. By the way, how does it feel to be, like, on the other side? So weird. <laughs> so weird. Like, I'm dying to ask you questions right now. It's like, I'm trying to hold myself back from, like, being the person that's interviewing. So I'm like, okay. Like, yeah. Not in smile. Not in um, smile. <laughs> I just really yeah. respect and admire what you are doing in the community because it's so important. And... I know a lot of our listeners, a lot of our people who tune in, they are interested in starting their own podcast. So I wanted to have someone on the show to kind of give us the behind the scenes of what it really takes. I've been in this game a year now, and I know there's so much that I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm going to be a student as well as I'm asking you these questions. For sure. So why don't we talk about the story behind Growing Up Latina, like how it started what inspired you to do this thing? So, first of all, I'm Puerto Rican and Dominican, right? Um, I was born in Puerto Rico. You know, I moved to New York when I was maybe in the second grade, not knowing any English. So when I came here, I only spoke Spanish, but my mom forced me to go to public school. And so I had a lot of friends that spoke English, and that's how I quickly got acclimated to speaking English and just being like that New Yorkian type of chick. But my dad, to this day, I only communicate with him in Spanish. I fell in love with the culture. Like, I always told myself there's nothing else that I would rather be than Latina. And I just had this vision one time. I I really don't know where it stemmed from. It kind of came to me in my sleep. And I just said, I really want to tell our stories. And for me, there's, there's people, there's some people that maybe don't know their purpose in life. I, very fortunate, have always known what I wanted to do in this industry. And... I think it expanded with growing up Latina because for me, it was like, okay, now I have this purpose, but like, what is the legacy that I want to leave behind? And so I had to really ask myself that question. Um, And growing up Latina was just something that it, it was, it was a project where if God forbid, I'm no longer here, this will always remain. And I just wanted to not tell celebrity stories, which is what I'm used to, but to tell all of our stories, like all inclusive. This is not about the celebrity. This is about the everyday Latina woman. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's really how I got started in in this specific project. And it was very clear to me. I wrote it down. Um, I had a publicist at the time and I gave her like, like a list of projects that I was working on. And I put in red growing up Latina. And she was like, oh, what's that? She was like, I'm interested in that. What is that? Mm -hmm. And I was like, it's just this project that I really want to work on. And, you know, I kind of gave her exactly the vision I had for it. I even had a list of women that I would interview for it. And she was like, no, this is like gold. Like, you got to move forward with this. Mm -hmm. So that's really how it got started. You know, I never thought about the legacy piece for Mm -hmm. Banking on Cultura. And you just kind of like planted that scene just now because Mm -hmm. you're so right. Like this will live on beyond me. So I don't have any children. I don't know if God is going to bless me with that, but I have this platform. This is like my baby right now. So I love that. This is our legacy. We're building our legacy. I love, love, love. Okay. So came to In Your Sleep. You wanted to showcase our stories. Mm Mm-hmm. You launched a podcast and then a couple of things happened on the journey. So let's talk about that. So I launched Growing Up Latina five years ago. 
five or six years ago. I want to say five years ago. Um, and I started with three interviews and I was completely funding everything myself. But this was before podcasting became a thing. And so I, you know, had a videographer, I had the camera set up and the quality for me was where I was most lacking. And the content was there. The, the people I were, was interviewing, they were great. But the quality, it, it just didn't feel right for the vision that I had for this project. And so I recorded the three episodes and I was just like, mm, let me take a step back to take two steps forward on this project. And so that's what I did. I took a step back and I said, okay, like, how do I want it to look? What do I really want this to be? What is the message? What, you know, because for me growing up Latina, it's so funny, what I always say is like, I'm giving the perspective almost like Carrie Bradshaw because I am this New York girl telling these stories, even though from Latinas from all over the world, but I represent New York, mm -hmm. you know? So it was something that I really just wanted to, to stay true to that. You know, I'm, I'm really from El Barrio. So that's important for me to continue to embody that when I do these interviews. So I just took a step back. And during the time that I took a step back, I started working silently. And what did that mean? That meant copyrights, trademarks, that meant scripts, that meant pitching to guests. It, it just, it, I was just doing the groundwork silently. And throughout that process, I learned a lot. You know, because trademark, although it sounds cool and easy, sometimes you run into some situations, right? Same thing with copyrights. And then I had these videos up. So it was like, okay, now I need to get an attorney. Had an attorney. There's so many things that I was learning at the time that I was like, ooh, this, like, I just wanted a podcast. Like, I don't know what all this is. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But okay. Um, and Hold on, I want to mm -hmm. pause here for a second because sure. there's a couple of really good takeaways. So. Mm -hmm. One is launching the podcast. You need to decide if this is something for play play or if this is something that's going to be an actual business for you, a tool to build your personal brand, because mm -hmm. that will drive the investment, how serious you take it, Correct. how much work you put into it, and also the final product, right? And also whether you're going to do this as like a real business, meaning going through the trademark process, the yeah. copywriting. What exactly, so the trademark I get, I understand, that's mm -hmm. the name, mm -hmm. right, concept. But what are you copywriting exactly? The IP, the, the IP, IP of the show. Because when I came out with Growing Up Latina, like shortly after, maybe like a year later, I also saw a few influencers kind of putting out Growing Up Latina stuff. So I was like, okay. So then when I went to my attorney, I said, hey, what do I do with this? And he was just like, hey, keep those videos up because it's timestamp. Like, we know that you put this out. And then during that time, I was getting the TikTok, the Twitter, the Facebook, which I owned the original, which I was actually shocked. Like, there was no, before me, there was no www.growinguplatina.com. So I owned that. I owned the original TikTok the original Twitter handle, the Facebook, et cetera. Um, and so that was very important for me to start there because if I sell merch and someone has that trademark, then they can say, no, I own this. Mm -hmm. And then I would have to be called something else. Got it. But that process in obtaining the trademark, that was like a grueling process for me. That actually almost took me out, made me cry a few times because there's so much that You know, I don't come from a background where my family did this. I have not one person in my family who's in the entertainment industry. And so I really just, the only way I learned was like by throwing myself into that. Mm -hmm. To give people perspective, mm -hmm. like how much does that cost? The trademark process, the copywriting, and just a clarity point on the copywriting. You said copywriting the IP. Is that like the format of the show or what exactly is the IP? Yeah, that, that's the format of the show. That's what, what you see on my decks. Like when I send out decks, you know, a lot of people will take those decks, right? They'll take it and they'll make it their own. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this is what she's doing. I'm going to do it like this and make it better. Um, and so when I, when I say own the IP, you know, no one can replicate my decks. They can try, you know, and, you know, we can sue. We never want to go to that level, but... You know, no one can replicate the format of the show. My ideas are very well thought out for years to come. Growing Up Latina podcast is just a small part of the Growing Up Latina universe that is being built. Got it. Um, so this is not, 
you know, and, and I, I think that's important to know because oftentimes when you're pursuing this, you don't see the entire staircase. You only see like the first couple steps. I saw what that entire staircase looked like. It was just about me taking the steps to get to that end goal. Got and it. so for, for me, like you said, to your point, in order to like really solidify a business, you have to run it as such. So that's like having the LLC, the trademark. I mean, that can, co- it, I mean, it depends. I mean, I did my trademark through legal zoom and then I, I solidified it with my other attorney that I actually had outside of legal zoom that deals with just podcasting, but that can run you about 1500, depending on how much you're trademarking. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause you also got to trademark the merch. You got to trademark, you know, like I said, I have the website. So that's something else that actually needs to be solidified. So it depends like what you're trademarking for. You know, mm-hmm. because I can have Growing Up Latina podcast, but then someone can have access to my merch and sell the merch. Mm-hmm. That's when it becomes tricky. Right. So I, I secured all trademarks so that I'm able to not only profit on my merch, but like, let's say I wanted to do like a documentary, Growing Up Latina, that's also mine. Mm-hmm. So again, I'm taking the steps. I see the steps. I'm not at that next level, but I'm securing it. Yeah. So that I can get there. Planning for the future. Mm-hmm. I love it. Okay, so started the podcast five years ago. Yeah. Into it, you decided, okay, the production value isn't it. I need mm-hmm. to slow down, Correct. work behind the scenes. And then you decided to relaunch. Yes. So talk to us about the sacrifices mm-hmm. that you made in order to relaunch. So, I mean, it was a couple things. You know, I was in the middle of planning this huge event. I had just signed a deal with Triller um, on behalf of Little Kim. So it was, I was planning like um, Biggie's 50th birthday party and I was working alongside with the estate and Little Kim. And, you know, my entire team was like, hey, let's put this out Cinco de Mayo. And I was like, no, 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 I have this huge event coming up on May 15th. Like, I'd rather just slow it down. Let's put it out for the start of Hispanic Heritage Month. But during that time, like I said, you know, I was working kind of like on the low. And what that looked like was like saving my money. So I actually... Did a lot of research to see, like, you know, what studios caused, um, what, like, who I would need on the team. And I actually wrote that down, like, okay, I need a social media coordinator. I need a brand partnership girl. I need, you know, someone. I, I mean, luckily, I have the connections, so I'm able to get my own guest. And then I've built it up to the fact that guests kind of reach out to me at this point, which is nice. But before that, you know, I was actually pitching out my own guests. Um, I had to get decks done. So, like, all of that cost. So I had to look at what a season would cost me. And the way I determined that was I watched Wendy Williams. And I was like, how many episodes does she have in her season? Because I want to run this as a TV show. Mm. And that's what I did. So I was like, okay, so she has this amount of episodes. So I just literally went on an Excel spreadsheet and I was like, all right, I'm going to do like 24 episodes for one season, which is like a lot. Yes. That's a lot that of episodes. Lot. <laughs> right? People don't even understand like, the work that goes into that's it. That's a man. lot of episodes. And yeah. then kudos to the podcast that put out like two times a week. Right. Because I'm like, that gets expensive. Mm-hmm. And so I had to estimate everything that included hair and makeup, outfits. All of Once I got that number down packed, then I was like, okay, I know what I'm saving for. What was that number? So we were looking at about a $50,000 show. Okay, for just 24 episodes. For just 24 episodes. At okay. the level. Right, at the level you wanted to do it at. At the level yeah. that I wanted to do it at. So mm-hmm. I was like, all right. And this includes, okay, let's talk about this because yeah. this is good. Mm-hmm. This includes production. So actually the producing of it all. You said your hair and makeup. You said wardrobe, social media Transportation, assistant, transportation liquor, candles that liquor, get put on the set. Mm, mm-hmm. The studio, the actual studio. cost of the studio, the editing. The Cutting guests, up the recap if you are videos. picking them up from the airport or something right. like that. Because you have to understand, this was before AI came mm. out. Like, now a lot of these things can, can get done with AI. You right. can cut the cost. Right. Before, it wasn't that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, I truly had someone on my team that worked overseas that was, like, cutting up my clips. Mm-hmm. You know, I had someone reviewing my episodes. Even though I review it because I, I, I'm a real student. In, You're the executive producer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, like, really, like, critiquing. I'm anal, too. My yeah. Team be like, really, be, And I'm like, yes. Yes, you have to be. <laughs> and so I just, I, I, I just took down those costs. And then also, like, I think the biggest cost for me that I was able to like cut out since then was like wardrobe, hair, and makeup. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I was like, now nah, I'm going to have to be a TikTok girl and, like, figure out the makeup. Because yeah. I'm not spending $200 on my makeup every yeah. single time. That's ridiculous. But not only that, it's the coordination. So now you got to coordinate when they're coming to do your mm-hmm. makeup. You got to coordinate when they're doing your hair. You got to put that into the timing of it all. Like, it's it literally lot. is a whole production. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you're doing it, like, at that level. Because when I Correct. first was thinking about being Artura followed the same philosophy i put together like my dream budget and Mm -hmm, i was like okay mm -hmm. this is what i want i was putting it up towards 80 to 100k Mm -hmm. for our first season but it had like all the bells and whistles and then when reality hit i was like okay what can we start pulling away from this um and that's the thing i was completely self-funded so like Mm -hmm. i had a team but everybody's pay relied on how much i was getting paid off of my events right and that's when it became like okay once i like start ditching out money and then i became obsessed with it so like once i started i just couldn't stop like Mm -hmm. people would try to get me to stop like ali just slow down i'm like no no no. like that's it like it's already creating buzz i can't slow down i have to keep going and everybody was like ali chill out like, we see you, but, like, you're going to go broke. And that's exactly what happened to me. And I dipped into, like, every type of funds you can think of. Savings account. Like I told you before, one of the biggest sacrifices I made was dipping into my 401k account. And that, I mean, I cried for that. That's when it became very real. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, like, I had to have really difficult conversations with my team and just kind of, like, tell them, like, hey, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go all in on this and it's gonna get crazy mm-hmm. and some people did leave me because you know this people's pay you know yeah. and I was just like oh well I, I gotta do it and mm-hmm. I, I did it people are very uh I would say uh risk averse yeah and tapping into your 401k mm-hmm. is huge big so talk to us about like why you made that decision I really believe in myself. And I think that's the biggest thing. I think if you do anything that you really are passionate about, you have to have the belief that you can do it. Because I felt like if I want my team to take me serious, they have to see me acting accordingly. And so when I made that decision, it was to show people like, no, I'm dead serious about this. And I'm willing to go this extra mile and replenish the funds but i want you guys to understand like i'm not playing with anyone's time especially my own and that's why i really just dipped in like that it was the last little bit of funds that i had um i felt like you know i'm still young (laughs) right that i can kind of take that risk and i felt like i could still make the money back you know if i hustled I can still kind of replenish those funds. So th- that was like the end goal that I had in mind. Like, okay, I'm going to take out everything. Because I did. I took out everything. Like, everything. So you got hit with that that tax bill. Oof. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. And and people ask me all the time, did you take out a loan against your 401k? I'm like, no, I depleted it. Mm. There was no loan against it. It was just like, you'll just give me everything. Mm-hmm. And they were like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, no. Run me my money. Yeah, like everybody was, <laughs> it's so funny. Everybody was like trying to talk me out of this. And I'm like, like, as if, like, what, what is the better way? Like, does anybody have ideas here? <laughs> like, yeah, we could reach out to sponsors and all of that. But like, I need immediate money right now. Mm-hmm. So if it's not on a credit card, this is like my next thing. Either way, it's still money that I would have to replenish back. Have you been able to replenish it? Yeah. Love yeah. That. Yeah. Love that. So I'm excited so about that. So it was worth it. One, no, I, I would never take it back. Really? I would never take it back. So no regrets? No. I love that. Okay. No. So we replenished the 401k. Mm-hmm. We back in business. Yeah. So talk about the monetization of podcasting. Mm-hmm. Because once you decide, okay, why are you doing this? Mm-hmm. You're going to seriously pursue this as a business. You need to actually generate revenue for it to be a real business, right? Real businesses make money. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, that's the goal. That's at the least, goal. I'm not trying that's to like goal. throw shade on anybody who's on the tre- who's in the trenches right, right now because I know how that goes. Mm-hmm. Um, but the goal is to make money, is to scale. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about how you've been able to monetize the podcast because mm-hmm. I think that's a really great takeaway for folks. So I want to be very transparent. Yes, you can monetize the podcast, but if the real question is what I put in, have I been able to see that money? No. Yes, I replenished my 401k. Yes, I'm able to pay a staff. But 
am I seeing profit on this right now? No. No, I actually get paid less. I haven't gotten paid off of my podcast. I'm totally fine with that as long as it keeps running for right now, at least. You know what I'm saying? Like, obviously, the goal is to make money. But there's a few ways. You know, for me, I've because of my event planning company, I've worked with so many big sponsors that I had direct access to these people. But then the the companies that I didn't have direct access to, I just emailed and I just literally picked up my phone and called. And I'm just like, hey, give my little elevator pitch. This is what I'm doing. And that's the thing. Like, you real. that's why I'm saying the biggest thing you could do for yourself is to believe in yourself. Because when you give them that story and there's some belief in there, oh, they're going to buy into it. Mm -hmm. And that's really what happened. I I try not to, like, I try to stay very uh, true and and nostalgic to the brand. So, like, Corona, um, you know, Presidente. Goya, you know, those Latin companies were like the first people I reached out to before I like started kind of branching off. And what are what are they looking for? Like what should people keep in mind when they're looking to like pitch a brand to come in on the podcast? I mean, so there's a few ways that you can do it. I do a lot of my batch recording. So because I had some immediate funds of my own that was available to me. I started batch recording and then I... T- mm-hmm. Hold on. Let's talk what batch recording is. Okay. Remember, a lot of people, they we know that yeah, yeah. vernacular. We understand that. Yeah. But like, let's break it down so people can really digest this and understand. So sure. what's batch recording? Batch recording looks like three episodes. I recorded up to three episodes, a, like maybe like once a week. And then I will begin to have... Like, I'll have my team start editing it out. But what batch recording allows you to do is to remain consistent. Because if you have a week-to-week podcast and you're waiting for that next week and you're like, you know, you have to do this interview, now you're rushing edits. You're rushing everything. And so what I do is I I pitch out for, you know, months ahead. And I kind of already know, like, okay, well, May, da-da-da, I have this person. June, da-da-da, I have this person. So by the time... Now, this is the way I work. I do not wait till sponsorship funds are available to me. No. I lock in the interview. I record the interview. And then I give it to sponsors. So I'll say, like, hey, I have these five people coming up. Do you want in on this? And I would write an email that includes, like, their social media numbers, my numbers, my demographics, my reach, you know, my Jesse Reyes interview went viral. So I also include that like, hey, we did over 7 million views across platforms on this one interview. So this is why you should buy into these. And so I really just put forth my value. So for me, my pitch is just making sure that I use my interviews as a selling point Mm -hmm. to be able to secure sponsorship dollars. So your strategy is having your interviews recorded all good to go, mm-hmm. having your prestigious guest lineup, and then pitching it and saying, like, do they want to place ads during the interview? Is that right. okay? That's one way. Okay. The second way I do it is I review my interviews and I listen to content pieces. So, for instance, if I talk about mental health, I will reach out to like a better help, for an example, and say, hey, you know, I spoke about, you know, my mom having Alzheimer's and the importance of mental health. And November is Alzheimer's Awareness Month. How can we partner up? I think the synergy would be amazing here. And it's very true to my real experience. That way they understand, like, I'm not just reaching out to you because I necessarily want your money. I do. But also there's like a real messaging. Yeah. Yeah, there's a real messaging behind this. So that's the other way I go about it. I listen to content. Mm, yeah interesting yeah interesting and what if you are like not batching so you don't have every guest that you have coming up in the future Mm -hmm. but you have a solid portfolio of guests you've had in the past Mm -hmm. like how would you position that we interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Ooh, this is really good. You should know about this. So I don't know about you, but I've been known to procrastinate, especially when things scare the hell out of me. The fear alone would have me stuck, overwhelmed, confused, and all types of self-doubt. And don't even get me started on the imposter syndrome. Okay. okay. After getting laid off, not once, but three times, honey. I realized that the security blanket that I made up in my head was just an excuse because I didn't really want to bet on myself. 
The corporate benefits that had me in that headlock, girl, huh, they went out the window once my job decided that they no longer needed me. Turns out that I'll save a whole nickel if I cut your salary completely. The truth is, the only security blanket guarantee is the one that you create for yourself. In other words, until you start a business, you will always be at the mercy of a company's headcount and you will never have complete control over your time, which means you'll be renting out your thought leadership and helping build someone else's dream instead of your own. If you've been waiting for a sign, this is it. Don't you think it's time you stop playing small and tap all the way into your power sis? Click on the link to learn my three-step process, the exact three steps that I took to make the transition from corporate to entrepreneurship. And this is helpful even if you don't know what type of business to start and have only one source of income. And this is absolutely free. It is my gift to you. I want you to win. It's winning season. In fact, what's that? It smells like winning season. Okay, so tap in and I'll see you inside the training. Let's go! Mi gente, I need your help. Look, the real game behind podcasts is we need to really understand our demo, a.k.a. you, our audience, so that when we go out to sponsors who help us put on this amazing show and deliver this content to you, that they can clearly understand who we serve and what is significant to you and what you value. And the only way for us to get that information is for you to give it to us. So we just created this survey. I'll put it in the show notes. It will take you less than three minutes, literally, but it will be so helpful for us to get a better understanding of what it is that you care about, what's important to you, what do you value. So that when we're out in these streets trying to secure the big bag and get sponsors for this show, they know exactly who our audience is and what you care about. So we can bring you the best products, we can bring you the best organizations that are out here serving the cultura, the community, you. So please take a moment and fill out the survey. I'll link it in the show notes. Appreciate you. So that's a numbers game. That's a numbers game. That's when you have to start pitching your numbers. Now, and when you say numbers, what are the numbers? So you're looking at YouTube and audio numbers. Okay. But what I find is that audio numbers supersede kind of like that YouTube number. And the reason why is you can have a podcast that just runs on audio and just just run that audio on YouTube and still do solid numbers on that and make it available for people that may not have Spotify, Apple, or so on and so forth, right? But they're able to listen to it via YouTube. A good podcast that does that uh, is Latina to Latina. So they're all audio-based, but they run their clips, their audio interviews on YouTube as if they're actual episodes that you actually seeing like a visual mm -hmm. component. It's just the audio. Mm -hmm. And what it allows you to do is really double back on those numbers. So now when you go to sponsors, you say, hey, these are my audios and these are my actual YouTube numbers. And that's really what they look at is those numbers. What are those downloads? Mm -hmm. For me, I always say the audio is way more important than the visuals, even though I'm like aesthetic crazy. Um, aesthetics is cool, but if those numbers don't match up, it's not that cool. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's two different strategies here. Yeah. It's the strategy of doing the batch recording. Yes. How how long in advance are you doing that before you pitch a sponsor? Because 24 episodes mm -hmm. could take, like, I mean, unless you're doing it in two weeks, which is totally possible. Yeah. Um, like, what is your kind of, like, your rule of thumb? Are you, like... Six months out, are you... In terms of interviews? In terms of... Or when I'm pitching. In terms of the interviews and mm -hmm. then when you're pitching, right? Because you got to lock in the guest first to then pitch. Right. On that first strategy. So in terms of interviews, like we're in May right now. So I'm booked up until August. But then I have like a little vacation in between then. And then I'll start going again. So now I'm booked up until August and now I'm already thinking of Hispanic Heritage Month. So that's just to give you an idea of like the guests that would come up. So when I start reaching out to sponsors, it's not that I'm pitching them my next 10 episodes. I'll select a few based on the actual sponsorship. Like, okay, I have this person coming up, this person, and I'll give them the dates. Like, hey, these, this interview's coming out this date. So that there's real timeline. Mm -hmm. Because I also like to give deadlines. Like, I don't want you to linger this conversation. Like, Let's start really applying some deadline here. Like this interview is coming up June 1st. Mm. What can we do? And and then I start aligning the months, right? So if I'm looking at June, now I'm looking at Puerto Rican Day Parade, right? So then I start aligning that. Like what can be done here? Who can I reach out to where the guests make sense? But then also I can have like 
the, you know, s- still drive this mission and this, this, you know, amplify that. The fact that it is a Puerto Rican Day Parade, again, very true to my experience. So a lot of people ask me, like, well, how do, how do you know who to reach out to? It has to be true to me. Like, if I don't wear it, talk about it, you know, if I'm not, you, and, and that's the other thing, like, and this is even with my personal brand. People will say, oh, try this makeup or try, like, send it to me first. Let me test try it. And then I'll let you know if I'm able to actually speak about it. Because if it doesn't work, there's no dollar amount that you can give me to fake the funk to my audience that is going to work. No, it has to be true to me. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. I forgot what was your other question. So the other question was... um... It was like like how far and... in advance uh-huh. you're doing the recording. So you kind of gave us some input. It's like three to six months, it yeah. sounds like. Mm-hmm. Um, so like that's one strategy mm-hmm. if you want to use the guest as leverage. If your show is contingent upon guests. If your show is contingent upon guests. If your guest. show is not contingent on guests, then you go for content. Another podcast that I'm always like bragging about just because I love them, Earn Your Leisure. Yeah. I mean, this podcast, think about it, like they, <laughs> they're not in like the most aesthetically pleasing places. Mm-hmm. They're literally in their hotel rooms and just mm-hmm. putting like a virtual background. But the reason why they're able to get people to like tune in is because the content piece, they're providing information. So you have to really look at your podcast and say, hey, where am I trying to go with this? Am I trying to be, am I trying to provide resources or Am I just interviewing guests? I like to do a little bit of both. Yeah. I think with Earn Your Leisure, which is like a whole business case in itself. For sure. They are providing amazing content. But Mm -hmm. what has allowed them to blow is, A, they launched during the pandemic when everybody was at home tuning into podcasts. Correct. But also they had a whole bunch of celebrities who pushed the initiative and what they were working on. So they had this huge community now that is now tuning into everything that they do. So the question is what happens when you don't have that? Correct. Right. So when I don't have that, you know what I'm saying? I didn't have that. Um, I was fortunate enough to already work with celebrities. Um, But really what I, you know, I'm from the Bronx. So I was going to the barbershop and playing my podcast. I was going to the hair salon, the nail salon, and like telling them like, no, you see that? Yeah, I was, oh, I was. I was knocking on doors like, hey, Jose from La Bodega. Like, uh, he was like an run- artist out here. Like, yeah, no. Out their I was very much on that level. Like, because for me, the celebrity can post and that's great. But I'm trying to touch real Latin people, not just the celebrities. Like, it's important for me. And I, <laughs> I have like this like case study of this person um, that I created. And her name is Miguelina. And I always say, well, what would Miguelina want? Who is Miguelina? What does she do? She's Who like is- your avatar. She's like the per. She is my consumer. Yeah, yeah. She, avatar. yeah, she's the person that consumes the content. She's the person that, in my mind, she goes to nursing school. So I already said, like anything I do, I'm like, will Miguelina like this? Like, how will Miguelina respond to it? Is Miguelina listening to this in the gym? Is she, is she listening to this on her way to work on her lunch break? Like. Who is Miguelina? Because that's my target audience. Mm-hmm. So I mm-hmm. kind of created this person in my mind. I love that. So mm-hmm. key takeaway, have your avatar. For and sure. keep them in your in mind as you're creating the content. Mm-hmm. But let's talk about distribution because I think that is huge. And before we head to distribution, mm-hmm. monetizing podcasts, sponsorships. Sponsorships. Is one, okay, another way. I also do events. Events. As okay. well. So sometimes, you know... Like, I actually had a deal that I worked out where they wasn't 100% sold on the episode, which totally fine. But I was like, hey, like, I really know these women. These are not women that I just interview and that's it. It's not a hit it and quit it type of thing. This is, like, women that I actually speak to on an everyday basis. I would love to do, like, a brunch or something. So it's like, if you're not going to give me money on the episode, you're going to give me money somehow. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then I actually did that with Zona de Cuba. So I did the season finale for season one as Zona de Cuba. I partnered with uh, Jack Daniels. And I said, hey, let's do this season finale where we're actually recording this as an episode. And that's what we did. So the season one, I brought about 10 women to the table. And 
And uh, yeah, like it was fully funded by them and and I was still able to use it as an episode. So they actually got two key takeaways. They got the Instagram and socials from the 10 women that were there, but then they also got an episode out of it. Mm, yeah. Got it. Okay, mm-hmm. so events. Events, So yeah. we have events, we have sponsorship. Merch. We have merch. Yeah. We have ad placements. Absolutely, yeah. Content. Content. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I do, you know, a lot of the money too, believe it or not, like I do make on TikTok Live. Um, so I do something that's called Sala Saturdays, where I go up on TikTok Live and I'm literally at home in my robe at the Sala just talking. Uh, I don't really have a script. I just kind of just talk and just kind of update everyone with what's going on. And then like people will just buy into it. Mm. Similar to like Instagram when you buy and badges. And you do that from your Growing Up Latina page. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should do that. Yeah, definitely. You mm. should. Like, just, just start talking. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. I mean, at first it was a little intimidated because at first it was like 10, 20 people would show up. And then I'm like, mm, I don't know about these numbers. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. But then the more you do is it, just like more people just mm-hmm. kind of tune in, mm-hmm. you know. And again, that's where I get like my inspiration for like next guests. Like, they'll tell me like, hey, we want you to interview this person. I'm like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Or I'll tell them like, yo, reach out to this person for me. And they'll right, start right, like, like tagging yeah, crazy. yeah. I love that. Okay. Mm-hmm. So distribution. Mm-hmm. So somebody's just starting mm-hmm. and they're trying to get their name out there. You gave one where you was like, you literally were walking up to the salons, barbershops, et cetera, asking mm-hmm. them to play. But how else can people really double down on like distribution so people can know like, hey, this exists. This podcast is here. Yeah. So I'm really big on newsletters. I'm really, re- I mean, and my team will say it. Like, I I do not play around with newsletters. Like, that is something that, you know, people can sell newsletters, you know, off of their contacts mm. if you build it correctly. Um, and I find that newsletters for me is, like, my most effective way. And I'm able to really see the clicks, who's opening up the the email, who's and, – and I do it in my own voice. And I think that's also important. But I'll give them, like, recaps of the week – uh, the interview that's coming out, what's to come. Because well, remember, if you I'm, don't have like a big subscriber list to your newsletter. I'm old school. Like I like, I'm the type of person where I'm like, who do I want to listen to this? All right, go on Instagram. Okay, that's their email. Let me input it. Mm. It takes more time, and then I also DM people my episodes like I'm like and and that's just me like I don't really have a team that does that I'm actually really crazy about social media in terms of like my team laughs at me because they're like we can run it we can run. I'm like don't run my social hold like, on so I, these are more plays okay. yeah so running it back going to Instagram a lot of people do put their contact information yeah. out there so grab that up I mean the bots are doing it so that's why I get all these random calls I'm like how you got my number yeah hello anyway yeah then the next play is also sharing your episodes in the DMs. Yes. Okay. And I'm very intentional. Mm-hmm. You know, I pick the best clip. Excuse me, and I'll tell them like, "Hey, you know, if this is something that you that you like." I don't force anyone, so but are, I just tell them to to share if if it's something that they love. So, growing up Latina does both video and audio. Correct. So when you're sending it are, out to people, are you telling them, "Hey, check it out on YouTube," or are you telling them to check it out on audio? On audio. On audio. Because right now, sponsors, they're buying into audio mm. more than anything. Okay. The YouTube is cool, but I run a lot of YouTube shorts, and I still monetize off of my YouTube shorts. I actually make more money on my YouTube shorts and, like, my reels than I do on, like, the actual episode because no one is going to sit down and watch an hour episode. And I, I love everybody that I interview, but... To get someone to lock in for an hour, hour and a half is hard. Mm. So I'll run a few clips on YouTube Shorts and monetize off of that. And you're able to monetize YouTube Shorts because you had like a certain amount of watch hours? Yes. Okay. So I think you have to reach like 400 watch hours. Okay. Um. So once you reach that, same thing with TikTok. I think you have to reach like a thousand um, before you're actually able to go live. So you have to get to a thousand followers. Followers. Right. And uh-huh. so that's why for me, short form content is like the best way to go when building this podcast up. Mm. Even if you do half hour episodes, like let's let's just think about like all the clips that you can cut up from mm-hmm. the half hour. what I like to call it is building social equity. Yeah. That's what you're doing in this process. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. So we've got several plays for distribution. Yeah. Love that. All right. So 
I want to talk about networks. Sure. Because there's tons of podcast networks that mm -hmm. are popping up all over the place, mm -hmm. promising distribution, promising ad revenue. Yeah. Um, and, and basically, y'all, for those who don't know, there's these podcast networks where they house a whole bunch of different podcasts that and and the benefit for them is then they go out to advertising they're like hey we have all these podcasts on our network give us your money and we'll place your ads across the podcast on our networks mm -hmm. right so that's the value add for them and then mm -hmm. for the podcaster the thought is the network is so bomb that they're actually bringing in real revenue dollars and mm -hmm. they don't have to go and hunt for sponsorship placements and and all that jazz so mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on podcast networks do you think you should be a part of one? If so, what you should be looking out for? How should you assess? Mm -hmm. What should you be asking for? All the things. So I feel like podcast networks are cool. It doesn't hurt. It can only just help the situation. But I feel like if you run your podcast like it's your own network, then you're good. You know, like, that's why for me, I really watched Wendy Williams and I really just said, like, how am I going to create my own TV show? So what? So when these when these podcast networks look at my content is really ran as a show versus like a, a podcast, so to speak. But I look at a few things. I look at other podcasts that they've made have signed in the past. I look at the content to make sure that one, I'm not competing with anyone else's content, but two, to make sure that the content can really live here. And it's like a place where, again, the mission for me is just to amplify our voices. So as long as those things are aligned, then I think we're good to go. I mean, I've had a few meetings. There's, I'm not signed to a network. And for various reasons, I, I am really anal about giving up equity into growing up Latina because this is my baby. And this is something that I've, I mean, blood, sweat, tears for this project. So I feel like when I team up with someone is because they can add to it, something that I cannot do for myself. So I look at what can you add? What is the money looking like? What like what can you do? What what monster machine can you really give me right now that is going to expedite this entire process for me? But giving up equity is so important and and yes, you know, if you want to scale your business, 1000% you should go into partnership, but understand that not all money is good money. And partnership is very is very easy to get into a partnership. It's very hard to get out of one. Mm. Great advice. So let's get into the Talk That Talk segment okay. where we, uh, you know, discuss something taboo in the yes. cultura. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier your mom yes. um, suffered from Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So you have an actually an interesting story yeah. around why you decided to go public with that information and how your family responded to that. Can you share? Yeah, so I I had an interview with Melly and I'm very like freestyle with my interviews in terms of like I may write the questions down but I rarely look at them. I'm really in the moment and for some strange reason I just opened up about like my mom having Alzheimer's. It was something that I've never shared before but I pre-record my interviews so I still have control of like when this interview comes out. And I just remember kind of like telling people like, damn, I maybe I shouldn't have said that. And everyone was like, why? And I'm like, I think my family will be really upset that I just shared this. Even though it's my experience, it's still something for my mom to share. And so I took it to my family and I said, hey, you know, um, I just recorded an episode where I basically said mommy has Alzheimer's. And people in my family were like, nah, you can't, you can't put that out. Like that interview can never see light of day. And I'm like, well, I can't cut that out either because if I cut that out, that's a major part of the it. Like it won't even flow. Mm -hmm. And and then I was like, why? Like why are why are we like keeping this a secret? I don't understand. And they were like, we don't want people to know. And I'm like, it's but it's fine. So that it was that part for me that I'm like, why are we keeping this a secret when this can potentially help someone? And this is my experience. And I went forth and released the episode and. Yes, people in my family really got upset at me. It was like a huge ordeal. Like, why would you say that? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm not saying nothing that's like crazy. I feel like just this can help someone. And what I found was that once I released it, one, it was a release for me. But two, um, 
other people, like my followers, were kind of DMing me like, oh, my God, we didn't know. Ali, how's everything? You know, uh, my mom has Alzheimer's. My dad has. So it was like a community of people that were there to uplift me. Mm-hmm. And I and that's when I said, you know, this is why I have these conversations on the show right. for this reason. Yeah. Yeah. There is this stigma that exists yeah. in the community where we don't want to talk about mental illness. Why? Specifically. Why is that? They're embarrassed. I but embarrassed like of what? Thing. I think people view mental illnesses as like a curse and a weakness. Mm, it's mm-hmm. like, oh my God, that happened to our family. Yeah. Oh my goodness, let's keep it on the wraps. Let's not tell nobody. Yeah. And I think it's just the stigmas that come with mental illness without people really understanding what Correct. it's about. Yeah. Um, and not really taking the proactive approach and and educating themselves about what it is about. Correct. Um, and people are scared. And I think in the Latino community, we just have always been taught to keep things in the house. Like we don't we don't go outside and so talk about weird. our business. We keep it in the house. So but weird. what's so crazy is it gets out some way somehow it because the tias are talking about it. Your next door neighbor knows about it. You right. know, Tito at the bodega knows about it. Right. But nobody talks about it. But everybody knows about it. And the thing, the thing <laughs> is that, like, you got to be real. Like, especially in this podcast game, like, people really respect authenticity. So, like, how I cannot, like, me creating this facade image of myself is whack to me. That's the only word I could just, like, think of. It's just so whack. Like, people need to understand I'm a real person. I'm going through real things. You know, I really went broke. I really struggled. I really am dealing with my mom who has Alzheimer's, who literally asks me all the time, who are you? You know what I'm saying? These are tough things, but like these things need to be said because I want people to know that they're not alone. Like I'm going through it too. And if I can still make my dreams come true and make it possible, so can you no matter what circumstance you're in. Mm-hmm. What is your advice to those who, who might be struggling with a parent with Alzheimer's mm-hmm. or a mental illness, a family member, uh, but they have this shame around it? What is your advice? I found that therapy really helped me. You know, I really had to, and it was actually recommended by my mom's doctor. Like, she was like, hey, you're her caretaker. Like, you may need to, like, also go to therapy because it's really hard for caretakers. I couldn't speak to anyone in my family. I I just couldn't. It it was just, you know, when you have, like, just so many opinions weighing in, yeah, they're my family. Maybe they could relate for sure. But I, I found that therapy really helped me. And then also journaling. And this is something that I talk a lot about on my show. I do a lot of scripting, so I write in the future tense. So I already am manifesting in real time, like, what is already happening. And I do that a lot with my mom. So even though she's not in her best place today, she will be tomorrow because it's already what I manifested. Mm. So I find that my imagination is a better place for me than what's actually going on in reality. And I live in that because your subconscious mind can't tell the difference between what's real and what you're imagining in your mind. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Well, thank you for your vulnerability, for your transparency, uh, for giving Latinas their flowers. Thank you. Um, So, guys, make sure to check out um, Growing Up Latina and also the Ali V Experience, yes. your marketing company and event planning business. Yeah. What do you have coming up? Where can the people find you? Like, give them all the deets. Oh, my God. I have so many things coming up. Um, I have a Puerto Rican pre-festival dinner that's coming up in June, which I'm super excited about. I also have a lot of episodes and the these next few episodes I'm about to release are like really like some powerful stuff. This is probably one of my most powerful work yet since I've started the podcast. And I have a few big events that are coming up. Um, Angie Martinez is one of them that I'm, I'm working alongside her team to produce like her barbecue. And she's been a client for mine for like a year now. So I'm excited to work with her. Very yeah. cool. Exciting. So you guys can find me at www.thealligyexperience.com or www.growinguplatina.com. I love that. And that's yeah. just and on Instagram, Growing Up Latina. Growing Ali Up v. Latina uh, on Instagram all over. And then Ali V, A-L-Y-I-V. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for being thank here, you. Amor. I appreciate you. It was my pleasure to give you your flowers. And now you have here. to come on my show. I would love to yes, come on your show. Yes, you have show. to come on my show. I, oh, my God. I'm going to be a Gloria yes, Latina. You have to come on my show. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. It yeah. would be my pleasure and also my honor. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you guys for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's episode, you know the deal. Make sure to give us your feedback, like, share, all the things. That is how we grow and that is how we Move the cultura forward. So thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll see you on the next episode. Ciao. Mi gente, I need your help. Look, the real game behind podcasts is we need to really understand our demo, a.k.a. you, our audience, so that when we go out to sponsors who help us put on this amazing show and deliver this content to you, that they can clearly understand who we serve and what is significant to you and what you value. And the only way for us to get that information is for you to give it to us. So we just created this survey. I'll put it in the show notes. It will take you less than three minutes, literally, but it will be so helpful for us to get a better understanding of what it is that you care about, what's important to you, what do you value, so that when we're out in these streets trying to secure the big bag and get sponsors for this show, they know exactly who our audience is and what you care about. So we can bring you the best products, we can bring you the best organizations that are out here serving the cultura, the community, you. So please take a moment and fill out the survey. I'll link it in the show notes. Appreciate you. Mi gente, did you enjoy this episode? Are you loving Banking on Cultura? Make sure to subscribe and follow us. Our goal is to grow this community so that we can all embrace our Latinidad, secure the big bag, and never question our cultura ever again. Please also take a moment to leave us a review. I love reading your reviews. Let me know what you are thinking, what guests we should have on, and if there are any topics you would like me to cover. I appreciate you so much for being here. Te amo mucho. And I'll check you out in the next episode.